Good evening. It's Wednesday, the 28th of February, 2024, and this is an extraordinary general meeting, uh, meeting of Rother District Council's Audit and Standards Committee. I'm Councillor Brian Drayson, the chair of the committee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the chamber and online to the meeting. Before we start, I need to cover some basic housekeeping. Can members in the chamber please remember to turn their microphones on by pressing the button nearest to them? And even more importantly, perhaps, remember to turn it off when you finish speaking. Uh, members, uh, on when we do vote, could you please uh, raise your hands clearly and keep them raised until the clerk has finished counting? And obviously for questions, if Councillor Barnes and Councillor Pearce can use the hands raised facility uh, on the online. We're joined in the chamber tonight by Lorna Ford, Chief Executive Officer of Rother District Council, uh, Mark Adams, Head of Digital and Customer Services, and Lisa Cooper, Democratic Services, who's acting as clerk to the committee tonight as Louise Hollingsworth is on leave. Joining us remotely, we have Councillor Barnes and Councillor Pearce, both members of the committee. We have Duncan Ellis, the Interim Chief Financial Officer and Deputy Chief Executive. We have Suzanne Antrobus, our newly appointed Deputy Monitoring Officer. And we also have Joe Powell, Head of Service, Service Housing and Regeneration. I'm hoping... Yes, I've seen him. And we've also got Darren Wells, our lead external auditor from Grant Thornton. I don't think I've missed anyone. If I have, apologies. This evening's meeting is in two parts, with part A looking at reports on standard matters and part B on audit reports. For part A, we have with us our independent persons, Bob Brown and Rose Durban, and one representative from RAUC, which is Councillor Mrs Wendy Mears from Dullington Parish Council. For part B tonight, Mr Patrick Farmer, our independent men member for audit matters, is unable to be with us this evening. So welcome again everyone, and we'll start on the agenda. Do I have your authority please to say, sign the minutes of the last meeting as a correct record? Yes, agree? Yes, thank you. Um, having introduced Suzanne Antrobus, uh, do you want to say, introduce yourself, Suzanne, before we move on? Oh, only uh, very quickly, Chair, just to say hello. And uh, I've just joined this week, uh, so I'll be getting used to everybody, and I'm very grateful to be invited to this meeting. Thank you. Uh, Linda Walker, our monitoring officer, couldn't be with us tonight. But... Um, Suzanne's picking up a few hints. Uh, any apologies tonight, please, Lisa? Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, Patrick Farmer, Independent Personal Audit. Thank you. Are there any additional items? Uh, there are none. And we move to disclosures of interest. To receive any disclosures by members of disclosable pecuniary interests or other registrable interests or non-registrable interests. It matters on the agenda and the nature of any interest in details of any dispensations obtained. Councillor Thomas. Um, Chair, it's not on the agenda as such, but there are one or two sentences relating to the housing company in item 7, but they don't appear to be of the controversial nature. I don't intend to say anything about them, and I would be surprised if any member of the committee did. Uh, but if such a thing was to happen, I would leave the room. Okay? Yes, thank so you. That's, so that's acceptable to you, Chair. Yes. Thank you, Councillor you. Thomas. Uh, nothing else? Right. So, moving on to Part A, Standards Reports, Agenda Item 5, Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman Complaints Monitoring. And this is a report introduced by Mark Adams, the Head of Digital and Customer Services. Mr Adams. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this evening I'd like to present the audit and standards, um, sorry, the local government and social care ombudsman monitoring. Um, the, the report is, is quite detailed. Um, 
and the, the first section covers the Ombudsman complaints, uh, which there are 10 of, covering the period 24th of May 2023 to the 12th of February 2024. <coughs> two of these have been upheld, two weren't upheld, and six were chosen not to be investigated by the Ombudsman. Um, so the, the report does detail each of, of these complaints. Happy to answer questions in relation to these. Um, there, there are learning outcomes as a result of these complaints um, that I've also detailed in the report. One of them is making sure that we, we don't delay a complaint investigation until a planning decision is made. The Ombudsman did pick us up on that. Um, one was improve in our escalation to management in terms of outstanding or overdue complaints, which has been implemented, I'm pleased to say, and um, a bit of housekeeping in terms of when a complaint is made, it's making sure that we respond to all, all the complaint points that have been raised. Um, like I said, I'm happy to answer questions either at this stage or at the end of, of the whole report. So um, the first part, like I say, is the section in relation to Ombudsman complaints and the, the second part of the report details non-Ombudsman complaints. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adams. Anyone got any questions on the Ombudsman complaints before we move on to the next part? Yes, Councillor Mears. Can I just make a comment, Jim? How huge to me the 134 uh, complaints seem to be. Um, it's enormous, isn't it? Well, it was, obviously, because it was transferred, wasn't it, from autumn to to now, the meeting, because of there being so many. Isn't that what I read? Hmm. I think it's... February. It was yeah, to I February think it's... Um, because there were so many. Yeah, that's the, the non-ombudsman. Yeah. Non-ombudsman. What a horrible word. It's huge, um, though, isn't it? But yes, uh, if there's none on that, we'll pick up the non-Ombudsman. The 134 is from May till February. So yeah. it's, um, but I suppose it has to be set against the number of contacts we actually have with our residents. But uh, Mr Adams. I think it was pleasing that there weren't any vexatious um, uh, inquiries. Because I know when we started, we thought there would be a lot of vexatious. And there isn't, so... That's good news. It still seemed an awful lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adams. Thank you, Chair. If, if I may answer for you. Um, the the complaints um, monitoring was, was slightly delayed due to a packed agenda in the, the December and January. So it does cover an extended period in, in relation to um, you know the, the, the number of complaints. Um, you know, it's normally a shorter reporting period. Um, the, the Ombudsman, I just want to raise, has, you know, the, the, they're all planning complaints that the Ombudsman um, have gone to the Ombudsman. So it, it's just, you know, a, a tricky um, area because, you know, a lot of lot of residents are unhappy with planning that are happening in, in their, their remit. Um, and it, it's not necessarily the, the actions in, in relation to the decision. It's more a case of, um, you know, the, the, the actions that neighbours feel they're, they're unhappy with the development. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. And the, you want to go on to talk about the non-Ombudsman complaints? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so the, the report um, has extended... Uh, um, due to sort of members looking at um, a bit more detail in terms of the non-Ombudsman complaints. So in the same reporting period, 24th of May uh, 2023 to the 12th of February 2024, um, there were 134 non-Ombudsman complaints. 83 of these were treated as service requests. So this is where um, a, a customer makes grievance um, and the department is unaware that, that a customer is unhappy. So before we, we can look at it as a formal complaint, depart, departments need to be allowed time to look at the issue and try and resolve it where possible. Um, so 17 were still uh, stage one, but they were resolved at what we call initial stage. So this is a, a proactive step where man our managers um, 
phone customers to try and resolve um, the complaint and you know listen see what we can do to um, put in measures to, to mitigate any any issues that, that customer have raised um, 24 were stage one complaints um, 10 were stage two complaints um, as a collective out of those um, complaints so in, if you look at a bit more detail on the stage one 17 were resolved at initial stage two were upheld 17 were not upheld um, with five being partially upheld and then one of those was escalated straight to stage two um, and of the stage two complaints which is um, customers completed the first part which is stage one these are where they're escalated for a senior manager to review so of the ten um, none of these were upheld um, five were not upheld and then five were partially upheld so in in terms of learning outcomes there there are sort of minor points that that we can take away from this um, and again the, the the breakdown of area is predominantly of planning um, you know picking up around sort of 35 percent of the non-obism and complaint side of things then it goes to like neighborhood services which cover um, waste car parking um, then it moves to council tax benefits housing so it, it, it's a, a good sort of a spectrum like I say complaints are a healthy thing uh, to have um, it's not a bad thing that there are so many it's a good opportunity for us to look at where things perhaps haven't gone right and, and respond to so um, you know I've never looked at complaints in a negative way it's actually uh, how, how we can actually look to address things and actually improve what we do but like I say I'm happy to answer any questions in relation to the, the detail in the report. Thank you. But there's a great temptation to ask for details of the partially upheld and things like that, but this report would then be several miles long, I think, not just these pages. Um, but you give us a bit of information and we want more, we want more. But I think we'll have to accept that it was partially upheld and dealt with, and, and we trust you on that. Are there any... Uh, Councillor Barnes? Yes, I think the point you've just made uh, rather illustrates why we probably need to separate standards from audit. Um, I was quite interested in the um, the ones that were treated as department service requests. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that suggests any change in procedure um, or whether we're happy with the way uh, whether the customers are happy to be treated as department service requests. Since 17 of those were resolved uh, without needing to proceed further, uh, clearly uh, the system is working, uh, but you do wonder a little if it's a complaint whether people are happy with a non-formal complaint resolution and I welcome uh, Mark's comment on that. Uh, beyond that, I think if there are any patterns, I'm sure Mark would draw our attention. I note there are a number of planning enforcement issues, but of course we've got a task force on planning enforcement at the moment. Um, but it might be useful if Mark could share some of those details uh, with the task force Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, happy to, to answer this. So, um, the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman are updating their um, process and policy in relation to complaint handling, and one of those is how you differentiate a service request to a complaint. So, there is revised guidance that we would need to adhere to um, by April 2026. However, the way we're doing things now is in line with that guidance. So um, we, we, we need to look at um, departments having that opportunity to actually respond to um, any issues raised. If, if at that stage the customer is still uh, you know, unhappy and aggrieved with that response, that's when it, the, the formal stage should kick in. Um, but it, it's, I, I feel it's wrong for um, complaints to be escalated straight to the formal stage without that opportunity to, to put things right in, in you know that, that department needs the ownership um, of, of, of the, the issue that the customer is raising um, 
and, and the second point Councillor Barnes made, um, yes, happy to take that forward with that, that task group and chair, um, you know, the, the outcomes, the planning enforcement team are aware of these complaints, but it's making sure, like I say, they've, they've got that information to inform that group and any decisions that, that they do make. Thank you. Just one question for me. Am I, am I right in thinking the, uh, on page 12, the very top, where it talks about the response times, that also by 2026 they're going to be sort of, they're going to be targets as well in like 10 days rather than 20 days? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as part of the, the, the revised policy from the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman, Time factor is um, being amended. They're, they're merging, I suppose, guidance from the housing complaints ombudsman side with um, the uh, local government social care ombudsman side. So they're, they're standardising the, the reporting side. So 10 days will be for a stage one response and 20 days will be for a stage two response. So at the moment, we, we're not meeting that standard. No, that's um, okay. That's work in progress. But it is, I say, work in progress. Um, and it's looking at taking forward what action we need to do ready for that, that new guidance. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Any more questions for Councillor Mears? Don't forget your button. Um, obviously, I represent the parishes, and I would say the enforcement, um, planning enforcement is one of the things that is most important to my people, really, above everything else. And it's very difficult for me to try and explain to them um, why if they've listened to a planning meeting and it's been qualified with various regs and then that's disregarded. They find that very difficult to understand, which just does come up. And we're often told um, it's very difficult, there aren't enough staff to get round to every situation, and thus it goes on and is elongated, maybe more than, more than it should be. Can I ask, is the enforcement team up to full weight? Because we have had a lot of, um, you know, waiting, and we believe it's because of staff. I, I just happen to know from my other yeah, job no. that we're... Um, We've got two and a half officers. We were up to three and a half, but that one has, has now left. But in fact, there is a, I don't know if we called it a task and finish group, but a group will be looking at a proposed new policy for enforcement that, that's come out. And uh, hopefully that, it may not be the answer to everything, unfortunately, because it comes down to money and staffing. And, and hopefully we can go forward with with some better uh, enforcement, because I agree with you. I mean, obviously, my email, my email box is full of complaints about enforcement. It, it's, it, it's a balancing act. But uh, the policy is being looked at, and yes, we've only got two and a half members of staff well, looking at it. Just say that, you know, when one sits in a planning meeting, which I did for a long time, um, you're discussing all that time the minute EI that will make that planning permission correct. And then to see it swept away you know, is, is very difficult. I just want you to note that. Thank you. No, I agree with you. Thank you. Don't forget to turn your microphone off, please. Otherwise, the camera will stay on you. <laughs> Councillor Thomas. Uh, i just say that I sympathise thoroughly with Councillor Mears and what she said. I think sometimes Rother gets the blame, though, when it's not really Rother's fault. It can be the thought, very frequently, of the developers themselves. Because my experience in my own ward is but what happens is that there's a, a development in Friot's Way. What happens is the developers flaunt the regulations frequently. Uh, they, they don't wash the uh, tyres of their vehicles. And it says mud all over not only that road but all the adjacent roads. They park vehicles where they block the highway. They disregard regulations about the care of the wildlife. They do all these things. And what happens is the residents who are up in arms... They complain to me. I then pass it on to enforcement, who are very good. They take prompt action, and then things are better for a bit, and then everything slips back again. And then those people say, Rother is ineffectual. Well, that's not really fair. Rother is doing all they possibly can under the circumstances. The officer is conscientious and does the job very, very well. The problem is with the developers. So I think sometimes Rother gets the blame 
when it should be the people who actually do the thing wrong that should get the blame. Just, just to sort of say that. On, because I do think that my experience of the enforcement team is that they do their best. Yeah. I'm tempted to say other developers are available. But it's, it, yes, um, that's your experience, uh, Councillor Thomas. Thank you. Are there any more comments for, uh, or questions? Sorry, Councillor Biggs. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I had a lady see me beginning of sep February. She's been waiting since September uh, to try and find something out about planning. I emailed the enforcement on the Monday. Tuesday, enforcement was out, looking at the problem. Wednesday, it was resolved. So they are trying, and they are proactive. I know it seems, uh, you know, some people do, but this was exceptional. She'd been waiting since September, and within two days, we had an answer. Well, so, there's one resident that has yeah. utmost confidence in their board member. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions for uh, Mr Adams, please, on this matter? No. Right, I think this is for noting. Uh, there's no magic uh, vote, so do we note this uh, report, ladies and gents? Just looking for nodding heads around the room. Yes, thank you. That is noted. And Mr Adams will be sneaking out quietly. Um, and now, agenda item six, which is the debate, not hate, uh, campaign ending abuse in public life for councillors. Um, this is for us to consider the Local Government Association's publication on how councillors can better support members to prevent and handle abuse. Linda Walker, our interim monitoring officer, is unable to attend this evening. And as we've said, Suzanne Antrobus is brand new. So Lorna Ford will be introducing this report. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, Chair. Um, as the Chair said, yes, this, this report concerns um, our Progress Against the Debate Not Hate um, campaign, which Rother signed up to back in February, so before the report was published um, that is referenced in the paper. So in July, the Local Government Association did publish a report on how councils could better support our councillors to prevent and handle um, abuse. And we are seeing an increase um, in abuse um, that impacts councillors. It's not just a rather problem, it's a national problem. And it's not just a problem with local councillors, um, it's a problem at all sector, at, at all um, levels of democracy. So this, this is quite a topical issue at the moment. And I think I'm really pleased to say that actually um, Rother has taken some proactive action in this area and, and, and the report really does demonstrate how we're on the right track um, with this issue. So, as I say, um, the LGA um, report from July set out, um, first of all, it set out the challenges um, around this issue and, ha and highlighted three things. Uh, one, that councillors feel vulnerable to abuse and not well equipped to handle that abuse and harassment and, in and intimidation. Uh, the second challenge was um, often there's not a clear process about re reporting these instances. And I know we've, we've sort of been working on that at uh, Rother, and it's probably one, one of the recommendations that we want to take forward about making that a bit clearer. Um, the third challenge was um, in some areas um, there's not a response from the police to these, um, these incidents and not well supported. Um, so there are a number of recommendations, and I think perhaps... For, for this meeting, we need to focus on the principles that are also set out um, in that report to support us all in improving in this area. The first principle um, was zero tolerance approach to abuse. And I think that goes without saying. Um, we have recently taken some action um, to make this clear. You notice posters around the chamber that weren't there um, in, in, until about six months ago when, when we put that in place. Um, but there's, there's other things that we are doing as well. Um, we do remind people um, in terms of pub, public speaking arrangements for participants at planning and full council meetings, um, what the expectation is. Um, and in the past, we've also had to uh, particularly uh, controversial meetings, uh, full council meetings, we have had to employ security personnel um, to support us to make sure that we're keeping both members, the public, safe. And we have, that has been tested quite recently um, at Rother. 
Um, I think there is a role here for our member development task group just to make sure this is kept on the agenda and to make sure that it's always at the fore. You know, it's, it's something that you don't want to put on the back burner. It's something that you really do need to keep at, at, at the forefront and make sure um, we're being proactive. Um, the next principle was about clarity of process and responsibility. And, and, and as I said, um, I, I think we've got quite an informal arrangement at the moment. Um, I think what tends to happen is people tend to speak to Lisa. Um, people have also spoken to me in the past as well. And what we're suggesting here is that we formalise this and that we have reports um, that come through to our monitoring officer. Um, so we're going to be doing some work around that. Um, in terms of relationships with the local police, I'm really, really pleased to report that that is not a problem at Rother. I have regular meetings with our area commander. They have in the past proactively got in touch with me if there's an issue that they're particularly concerned about and they have intelligence that's uh, pointing uh, that we need to do something. So that I don't think is a problem at Rother and I'm, I'm really pleased to report that. Um, the report also sets out principles of tailored risk assessments um, and I, I know we provide training on how uh, councillors can go about it, assessing their personal safety um, and it's also part of our member induction programme. So I think we're taking the right action there. Um, and then there's a general one at the end about prioritising councillors' well-being um, and I absolutely agree with that. that. That's something that we absolutely need to be mindful of. Um, councillors are able to access the council's employee assistance programme um, and, and, and they have in the past. So that, that is something that is being used and, um, and is, is there for all councillors to access if needed. So um, I think we, we are on, on the right lines here. Um, I, I think we've taken, um, it's something we keep under review and I think that's sort of demonstrated in the report. You know, when, when we're faced with something, we do feel how, we, we do think carefully about how, how we can respond to that. Um, there are four recommendations uh, that uh, the committee has been asked to consider. Um, one is about, um, uh, well, one, one is just to, to note the actions that we have taken. The second is about um, developing that procedure for reporting of incidents. Uh, the third is that the Member Development Task Group be reminded to review the support available and also that the LGA's report be noted. But I would say if there's anything else that the committee feels we could be doing that we're not currently doing, then it would be uh, really useful to hear that. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Lorna, please? Councillor Biggs. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see that uh, Lorna has meetings with our local police officer. Um, if someone from a parish council, obviously they don't have meetings with the police officers yourself, if they need advice, can they come to you? Absolutely. You know, if, if it's something that a parish is, is concerned about, I mean, I'd say to the monitoring officer, Lin, Linda Walker or Suzanne now. Um, so I, I think that's that's probably the right route. But, you know, we're, we're very happy to support um, and, you know, they should speak to the police themselves. I, I would say if it's something serious as well. Um, I think it, what was the point I was making is the contact you have, would they be able to be given that police officer's name for them to contact them direct or not? I mean, I speak to the area commander, um, so I, I, I mean, if it was something serious and we felt it needed to be escalated, we, we, we could definitely do that. Um, so that's Jay Mendis or Cara Tom, Tombling. Um, it's, they're, they're, they're the ones that we speak to about the, these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, just before I come to Councillor Mears, um, that might be something that we, we sort of, as part of the formalising bit, mm. that... Um, that Linda takes that on, at least as a point of reference, so that we know there's a problem across Rother, not just with Rother councillors, but there's a problem for councillors across Rother. Mm. And, and I can see something there, perhaps, for, for Linda to take on on that formalisation part of it. Um, before I come to you, Councillor Barnes, Councillor Mrs Mears. Can I say I have had this about four years ago? A lot of problems with a particular person and meetings and so on. And I went to um, Salk, didn't know, you know, which way. It went over helpful, but you did at least feel that there was some sort of support there because 
it's very unpleasant when you're trying to do your best and, you know, this person went round trying to cause trouble for me um, in the whole parish, you know, the vicar, everything, trying to, because of something that came up in a parish council meeting and wasn't the voted the way that he, um, he thought it should have been. And it was very nasty. So what I really wanted to say was, you know, do remember the parishes as well and that's obviously something that you're, that you're saying. Because we get that trouble as well, and I expect it will increase. In fact, as you mentioned Salk, that made me think of Ralk, and of course you're here as part, as a representative of Ralk, which would be something for Linda to include in her... It's all connected. Yes. Cans Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor John Barnes. Yes, just to... Um, on the last point... Um, Linda has already been to Rauk and uh, talked about this. So um, it's in the hand, I think. And like so much in this area, I think Roller is somewhat ahead of the game. And I think Laura deserves to be congratulated on that. She's aware of the point I'm about to make. The danger in all this is in the end... Uh, we tend to neutralise ourselves and uh, free speech suffers. I think, therefore, it's quite important that we, wherever we can, provide positive advice rather than simply uh, zero tolerance. Um, the, uh, the advice I was given when I first joined the council, which is a very long time ago now, um, was the sporting analogy uh, with councillors, play the ball and not the man, which, of course, anybody who's played team sports uh, knows precisely what is being said. And uh, similarly, I think when we're actually advising the public about complaints, I think the message we need to get across is it never helps your cause uh, to result to abuse and insults. Reasoned argument always works better. And uh, it's really having emotional spasms, which is really what a lot of abuse is. And it's particularly happening now because people are not in personal contact. Uh, they're using social media. Um, they're really letting off their feelings, but they're not advancing their cause they're not advancing their argument. I think we need to get that across to the public. There'll always be a few guilty people, uh, but we could minimise it with sensible, positive messages. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Gray. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do think this is an excellent report and very timely. I realise it's just addressing the public. And in nearly five years, I have to say that I've had no problems with the public. But my problem is here in the council chamber, and I don't know whether that needs to be addressed elsewhere, but Monday's meeting was the classic example where there was a lot of, well, just almost abusive behaviour. There was shouting, there was rudeness. When I stood up to second something, the people behind me were shouting and talking, and really it's self-putting and quite intimidating. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, yes, some of that I would say that falls to the chairman, but we did have a, a quite a difficult meeting on Monday. But um, yeah, hope not in this committee. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, your your point is well made, and, and we'll look at that. Yes, sorry. Yes, and, and I think that is covered by our code of conduct and those principles in public life. If we all lived by those, we wouldn't have those sort of situ situations at full council. Um, so, you know, it is about respect, and it, I think it is about calling it out when we see it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's slightly, I mean, it is related, but, you know, probably covered elsewhere. Yeah, I just want to say... I it was a difficult meeting Monday and there was no criticism intended there of Chair of Council. Um, it was a difficult meeting. But um, yes, I know um, there is a general push, I think, that's going to come from the monitoring officer about conduct, 
code of conduct issues um, of actually reporting one, even if nothing then happens, it's not a major investigation, but it's registered and eventually it will begin to perhaps show a pattern about a person's behaviour or a person's activities. Uh, Councillor Thomas, you can say something. Yes, I mean, I, I think that the initiatives taken so far are actually having an impact. As somebody who makes quite a lot of use of social media, I have noticed an improvement in recent years, the recently last year or so. So I think, I think it is having an impact. And I agree with Councillor Barnes about the importance of rational debate. Of course, there are limitations to that. If what he said was completely true, uh, Trump would not be in line to be the President of America. If rationality was the criteria, I very much doubt whether he would be in the running to be President. But when I look at what actually happens in social media, I do think there is far too much insulting going on and not enough reasoned argument. Um, I put something on uh, the other day about Lee Anderson before um, he was disciplined by the Tory Chief Whip. And I had a reply by a member of this council which begins with the sentence, it's about time you changed your medication, Councillor Thomas. Now, this seems to me, and I can make light of it, I can just say that's a completely unjustified attack upon bisoprolol, which is a perfectly acceptable form of medication. But I could nevertheless say that that is not really the way in which I would expect a member of this council to debate. But the problem is, if I start complaining about that, then I would be accused of the sense of humour shortfall, wouldn't I? It would be seen that I lacked robustness. So I think we've got to try to address this sort of low-level um, abusiveness, this low-level, um, what, what Councillor Barnes called playing the man rather than the, the game, but on the ball. And I think that's important because I think if you let that sort of thing slip by, then you get to a point where more important things slip by. And just the same way, if you don't deal with minor examples of antisocial behaviour, you're opening the door to more serious forms of antisocial behaviour. So I think we need to address those sort of minor things. And the things we kind of just almost take for granted, part of the, the cut and thrust of debate. It's not really just a cut and thrust of debate. It kind of leads to a particular kind of climate, and it can escalate. So I, I, think, I think we need to think in those terms. There is one particular local councillor, who I will not name, uh, who I think is notorious, a parish councillor, for the kind of things that person puts onto social media. And I understand that's being dealt with. But I only know it's being dealt with because of the gossip, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the whispering that goes on. I think I should know, I think we should all know, that this particular council is being very seriously investigated because that would give other people with experiences of that particular councillor the opportunity to add their voices to the critics of that particular person. And the last point I want to make, I, I do agree again the second time today with Councillor Mears, I am sometimes concerned about the parishes. I know two councillors on this council who, when they go to their parish council, they are completely unfairly attacked for what is seen as bad decisions by this council. And it's not right to hold two individuals responsible for collective decisions of the council that other councillors dislike. It, it's not just simply they get criticised, but they get shouted down, they get bullied. They, and as a consequence, it is very distressing for them. So I think there is a real problem in some parish councils, and so far as I know, the council is addressing that. But I think we should acknowledge how serious that problem is in a few cases. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Right. Um, thank you. I just wanted to echo some of the points about social media. I think it's really important that there is advice about social media at induction, but also as part of continuing professional development for councillors, because I think social media is changing rapidly. Um, there's now kind of much more about artificial intelligence coming in in terms of um, some of the implications of that. And I, th I think that use of social media isn't going to stop, but I think there's a responsible use, but there's also abuse that can come through social media. And I think councillors are entitled to good advice about that and good support. I have to say, uh, um, it's a shame, I mean, since 2020, I've not been on one of the social media things. Um, but I, I'm aware that I'm missing good stuff. I'm missing information because I can't stand the, the echo chamber that everyone's shouting in. But actually, I used to occasionally pick out bits and contact a resident 
individually saying, oh, have you got a problem with that? I can help you sort that out, rather than joining the general um, thing. So um, my answer to social media is not to be on it, unfortunately. Uh, but I realise I'm missing things out because of that. Uh, Bob? Yeah, just another small point, listening to what Council was saying about meetings and abuse in meetings. I think it's also very important, the training of chairs of meetings, the, the way meetings are, are, are actually chaired and organised. I've sat through many over the years, both in my former life as a police officer and working for other authorities, and some of the chairs have been brilliant, but some have been atrocious, and it's got out of hand as a result of them not controlling it properly. I'm not suggesting for a moment that's happening here tonight. It's been run very well, but you see what I mean from the point of view of parishes as well as chairs. Thank you. The check's in the post. Um, thank you. Uh, so, Councillor Granny, last comment on this one, because I, I thought it was going to be a quick one. No, it's not about this. Vicky Cook has just sent a message saying she's lost internet, but she's got nothing important to say. Councillor Mrs. Vicky Cook has lost interest. No, internet. Oh, internet. <laughs> Sorry, just check it. Just check it. Yeah, she's lost her internet. She's, she's had to leave the meeting. Thank you. <laughs> You've got that of humour as well, haven't you? to make up for all the bad stuff. Right. Um, I'm assuming there's no more questions. Lorna did actually do a wonderful job of repeating what the, it is, but I'm going to do it again, I'm sorry, so we just know uh, it's resolving. The first bit is that we, the council's actions to date to support councillors in preventing and handling abuse be noted, um, that the procedure for reporting the incidents of abuse be formalised, and the councillors be provided links to all relevant recorded training sessions, etc. I'm paraphrasing there. That the member development task group be reminded to regularly review the support available and the findings of the LGA associate uh, report be noted. Can I have a mover for that resolution? Thank you, Councillor Gray, and seconded by Councillor Thomas. Um, and a vote. All those in favour, please. That's uh, carried unanimously. Thank you. Slight short delay while uh, Rose Dove and Bob Brown and possibly Councillor Mears leaves. Thank you very much. Who knows next time? It might be a different committee. We are now going to move on to part B, uh, which is uh, audit. And at this point, I intend exercising a chair's rights to amend the order of the agenda. And I'm going to take agenda item 11 now, which is the Homes England 2023-2024 Compliance Audit Programme. I'm going to take that next. I anticipate it being short, and that will allow um, the presenter... Uh, Joe Powell, the Head of Service Housing and Regeneration, uh, to present it and leave. Uh, Mr Powell. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, this is a report for noting. Um, it's a compliance audit that Homes England uh, uh, inst instruct us actually to carry out uh, with an external auditor to ensure that the grant received um, over the period is, is complies with their uh, requirements for the grant and it's been used properly so we um, w one of our um, uh, properties that we developed with uh, using homes England funding was um, was uh, audited uh, to the value of three hundred and ninety one thousand and we got a, 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 um, a good response in terms of a good result rather of a green uh, assurance rating, which um, needs to be noted by the audit committee as part of the requirements of Homes England. So, yes, happy to take any questions, but here to present that to you. Thank you. I suspect there might not be any questions. Uh, I'll come to you, Councillor Barnes, but I'm sure there's going to be lots of thanks. Uh, Councillor Barnes. As you anticipate me, Chairman, um, I always slightly worried that uh, we note things which are really highly satisfactory. And I think actually we should formally ask Joe to thank those members of his team who really have done the hard work on this and earn the green. I, I think um, this is probably not the first green we've had. 
and that team really does excellent work. And I think uh, if we can note it in a more positive way in the minutes, I think we should. Uh, yes, very much so, Councillor Barnes. I think you might have stifled any other comments in the chamber with that one. All encompassing. Um, but yes, the, the minutes will reflect that, and it is a big thank you, Joe. Um, and it, it, yes, it isn't the first. I think the last one was a green as well, and, and a big thank you to you and your staff. Uh, so just before you go, I suppose we should note it. Is it noted? Noted? Yes, thank you. So it's noted as well as with thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Right, now we go to agenda item seven. A uh, report of the external auditor, Grant Thornton, with the audit findings report for 2022. This was circulated to members yesterday with apologies for Grant Thornton for the delay. This was partly caused by Mr Wells, our main external auditor, being off work through ill health. We're glad to see him back tonight and joining us uh, to present this report and also his colleague Raymond Tigano. So, nice to see you, Mr. Wells. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Raymond, if you don't mind, to uh, present, and if need be, I will chip in with any other comments. Yeah, I will do. Uh, by the sounds of that, I hope you haven't come back to work too soon, Darren. Uh, but, yes, Raymond. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so it's it's a separate report um, we, that's that's included on the um, council website. Um, our work on the audit is substantially complete and subject to the completion of outstanding matters. We noted on uh, page three within our report, and if we're satisfied with those um, outstanding matters, we are anticipating issuing an unqualified an, an unqualified audit opinion for 22-23. Um, within our report, we identified three adjustments. Uh, two of them uh, have been corrected by the management, and that has a net impact of 1.7 million on the net income and expenditure. And one uncorrected misstatement in relation to projected misstatement on unrecorded liability, and that's not um, adjusted on just on the grounds of materiality. Um, on page 23 within our report, we've also raised three um, recommendations for this year, uh, which management have provided comments. And next to that, on Appendix C, that's the carried forward um, prior year um, recommendations. And we're happy to say that in the span of um, uh, two to three months, um, going back to last audit findings report we had for 21-22 in December, Management have been able to um, to address three of our seven recommendations raised in 21-22, and uh, you've already seen the um, the value for money work or our auditor's annual report for 2023 in the last audit committee in December, where we raised um, no significant um, risk of uh, weakness in terms of value for money. I'll take the uh, the report as read, although I appreciate it's a tight um, um, delivery of our report, but I'll pause there to take any questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Tagana. Are there any questions? Oh, I'd even take comments on this report. Um, I'll say I read it and I was quite pleased with it. Um, and when I reread it, and I, I saw a comment you'd made today about you say about the previous recommendations in Appendix C, I thought, well, hang on a minute, we, we don't get 21, 22 till almost the end of 22, 23, so there's not a lot we can do. But of course, as you just commented, um, that's to be and in fact, the report says that's to be expected, and you're happy that we've done three and we're working on four. So I took this to be an overall uh, very positive report. And uh, I've just got one question, I think, at the moment from Councillor John Barnes. Councillor Barnes. Yes, Chairman. Um, page 26 uh, raises, it's, this is more of a comment than a question. It, it raises a quite important issue, which I know Duncan has in hand, uh, but it is quite important, I think, 
uh, that we get our governance straight and that certain things that happened in the past don't recur. Um, I'm talking some of, some of the decisions taken um, weren't cleared with members and some were not even reported to members. And that clearly is a breach of governance, uh, which it shouldn't happen again. It's slightly worrying um, in view of the public question, which was actually asked at Council on Monday, where again, it seemed to me um, that 130,000 had been approved. I'm not quarreling with the decision to approve it. It was a fact, however, it was not cleared with any member, which again is a breach as far as I can see of our financial regulations. So I would ask that uh, uh, Duncan or his successor uh, do actually make sure uh, that our house is in good order on this. I think our capital program is so big that it is very important that we recognize that this is a very risky area and it becomes absolutely imperative uh, that we keep a close eye on it in terms of monitoring and making sure that members are fully in the picture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barnes. Um, just on cue, Duncan Ellis has put his hand up. Duncan. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, yes, I just thought I, know, I appreciate that was a, a comment from Councillor Barnes, but I just thought I would respond to give you all a bit of an update because, as Councillor Barnes has indicated, the the capital program is is a large program for a small local authority like us. It's ten times the size of our net revenue budget, and while we are taking a step back to review a number of those large schemes for value for money and viability given recent inflation, the cost of construction and the cost of borrowing at the moment. We are being very, very successful in terms of getting additional uh, central government funding. Um, you'll all be aware of the, the levelling up bids that we've had success with of £20 million. Pounds. We've now got the new town deal, which is another £20 million pounds over 10 years. And we are hoping in the near future to have some more news around some other applications we've made. But all of those things continue to increase the size of the capital programme. Now, we've made lots of improvements this year, and it's nice that some of those things have been reflected and we've had positive feedback and positive comments. Um, Lorne has done a lot of work around governance, as have I. Um, we've got officers like Anna who are pulling together various boards, so there's increased transparency, increased discussion, and more visibility around that decision making. We're continuing to make improvements to the capital monitoring, but the real key for that, from my perspective, is that when we when we did the um, cabinet report on the budget the other night, um, there is a request in there to approve two new capital posts so that we can have the vigour and the support we need, given that the programme is um, coming towards £200 million. Pounds. Um, and we need to have that support. We need those people to do that work because it's, it is a big risk and it's a, it's a large area of work. And not only are we looking to, to get those capital accountants in place, we're also hoping to get a development manager because a number of those schemes we have in our, in our programme are large developments, large regeneration projects. And again, we need more capacity to make sure we can deliver those properly. So I'm hoping that that gives the, the committee a bit more confidence that we are continuing to work on it. We're continuing to make improvements, but we're also bringing in some more resource to make sure we can manage that whole process as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Duncan. <laughs> Sorry, John, uh, Council Barnes, you broke up. I said thank you for that update. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Councillor Biggs, is this, hopefully it's towards Grant Thornton, otherwise we can let him go. <laughs> uh, well, I don't think it's going to be Grant Thornton, Duncan, or Councillor Thomas, actually. <laughs> um, I know it's a lack of signed agreements. Um, this might have been done already. Uh, the, it says here the Council, the loan agreement in place with Rover hasn't been done yet finalised at the audit, the bit about Wilden, 
Um, and the working capital agreement with Robert is in process. Now, when I spoke to Duncan in December, he did say that some of these would have been completed by the end of December, the SLA. Uh, can anybody tell me if these have been done? I think that's one back for you, Duncan, as opposed to uh, Raymond or Darren. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know the SLA is imminently going to be signed. It's not signed yet. We've had some uh, final advice from our HR deport, uh, department in terms of some terms that we needed to include. Um, but I think I'm right in saying, I know Councillor Thomas is in the room, but I think it has been reviewed by the housing company. And I know that Amy is in the process of finalising that and getting it sealed and signed. She gave me an update today, um, but it's, it's imminent within the next week or two. Thank you. We were getting nods from uh, Councillor Thomason. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm getting the impression there aren't any questions specifically for Raymond or Darren. We're, this is for uh, noting this one, but I would like to say before, before they both go, I was updated today in a meeting of, with the PSAA on the recovery and reset arrangements to deal with the national backlog of audits. Um, I know we're in the 12% that have actually got their audits, and that is thanks to Darren and Raymond and Duncan working together really well. And we've got to the position where we're almost up to date uh, with 22-23. I'm just hoping that Grant Thornton and will be able to we'll be able to maintain that position and not slip back as the government put out. Um, backstop dates and, and allow, allow auditors longer. I sincerely hope we can keep our foot on the pedal and keep up to date and stay in that 12%. It's more of a plea to Darren and Raymond, but I see Raymond nodding, so I'm quite happy. <laughs> Raymond. Yeah, and I think it's it's all thanks to Ola as well um, for her for all her hard work on, on this um, audit. And it, it's also our intention to sign the accounts as soon as possible. I mean, we're very clear about some of the outstanding areas on um, page three of our report, which are very easy to fix, like um, for the pension. It's only the um, updated IS-19 report that we're waiting from the actuarial um, valuer. I mean, all the rest should be a fixed one once we've get, got the information. And it's, it's, it's not down to the lack of evidence um, that, that we experience from dealing with the audit. It's mainly to do with the, um, uh, from the council side, some of the uh, capacity issue rather than some of the um, lack of evidence that's not being provided to us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so having said thank you to you and, and to Darren, again, through Duncan, uh, another thank you to his staff and to Ola. I know she's not here tonight, but uh, a thank you to your staff, uh, Duncan, for keeping us ahead of the game. Um, it's good news tonight, really. Um, so this uh, report on the audit findings for 2022-2023 is for noting. Do we note it? Lots of nodding heading, so nod, nodding heads. So thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Darren. Uh, and I hope you get better soon, Darren, because that sounds really rough. Thank you very much. Right, moving on to agenda item eight, um, which is the revised statements of accounts for 2022-23. Um, our interim chief finance officer and our principal accountant, Ola Janowicz, uh, is not here tonight. So we get to Mr. Ellis Duncan. You get the substitute chair. Um, yes, I mean, this is directly uh, connected to the previous report we've just had from the uh, external auditors. Um, I'm not going to go into a, a detailed presentation on the accounts because Ola did a really, really good job of that back at our meeting in October. So you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through that page by page. Um, and as you'll have seen from the external audit report, there were very few amendments, very few changes, which again, is testament to Ola and the finance team in terms of the working papers that they have and their ability to pull the accounts together and the excellent relationship we have got with Grant Thornton because that goes that goes a long way as well. Um, it's extremely positive, as you've already mentioned, Chair, to be in a position 
this evening when we're there or thereabouts in signing off the 22, 23 accounts is amazing. Um, there are very few authorities across the country that are in that position. There are some authorities who, whose accounts, I think, go back to about 15, 16. Um, so, and there are lots that have two or three years outstanding. So I'm hoping that by the time the external auditors finish their final bits of work over the next week or two, we will be in a position chair to sign off the accounts um, at the end of this month. Uh, sorry, not the end of this month, because that's technically uh, tomorrow, um, the end of next month, so that we do it by the 31st of March. Um, and that's well ahead of that backstop date you mentioned of the end of, of the end of September. So it's a really, really positive position to be in. Lots of work gone in by all of the finance team. So again, my my thanks go out to them. Um, it's the approval of the accounts tonight that we're asking for, Chair, and there is a delegation within there as well, so that yourself and um, and I can sign off the accounts once that final uh, approval is given from the external auditors. So. Um, I don't need to say anything else about the accounts this evening. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? I've, I've begun to look at you, Councillor Biggs. Um, I don't think there's any questions. I, I, I see that sort of look of relief on your face. Councillor Barnes. <laughs> yes, Duncan is aware of what I'm about to say. Uh, because I felt it right to advise him. Um, it's always a problem when you're dealing with the accounts um, that they're not really, uh, they're a very arcane presentation of our finances, which is why in many ways um, commentary is very important. And I just get slightly worried um, when we don't use the opportunity in our documents uh, to educate interested members of the public and perhaps, although I say it carefully, uh, one or two of our own members who are relatively new. Um, the business and reserves, which is dealt with in 7, 8, and of course the balance sheet in 9, which also reflects this, um, and it's quite important because we've been using reserves uh, to actually balance the budget uh, for some uh, four years now, uh, since 2019. And at first sight, um, the statement at the end of uh, paragraph seven um, <laughs> seems to show we're in a better position. Uh, and we are. Uh, but it's not actually money that we can use. Um, and that, that's the problem, because it might suggest we're uh, less in financial straits uh, than we are. And it sits slightly uneasily with the right decision that Duncan has taken. I do congratulate him, which is recorded in paragraph eight, uh, where we've actually transferred four million to the general fund uh, to bring that balance to five million. And that reinforces the fact that in many of our views, that is the bare minimum, a third of our expenditure each year uh, that we should maintain in the general reserve balance. And I thought it might help if Duncan just uh, said a little more about that uh, to explain that really we can't go on drawing reserves much longer to balance the budget. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Uh, Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of the specific figure Councillor Barnes is, is talking about in relation to paragraph seven, it's, it's the final sentence there that talks about an overall sur uh, surplus of 16 million. But because of the sum of the intricacies and technicalities around central government and local government accounting, which is a, a bit of a dark arc compared with uh, the private sector, because there's all sorts of adjustments that local government have to do that other sectors don't have to do, but we still have to try and follow the same rules as best we can. So Councillor Barnes is absolutely right. That £16 million surplus you can see there 
Um, all of that, more or less, is in relation to the pension adjustment that um, Raymond has just been talking about. And what that is, is a forecast for the future. So in terms of all our current pensions, all of our uh, retirees and the value of the pension fund, that's a forecast of how well the pension fund and our liabilities are covered for the future. And last year and this year, that's moved by £16 million. But it's just a projection of future liabilities. It's not cash that we can access. So while a £16 million surplus sounds really positive, it's not money we can spend on services. It's not money we can put into the budget to use to deliver better outcomes for residents. It's an accounting entry. But because of the way we have to pull the accounts together and show these things, that's the right way to do it. But actually, it's 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 a, it's a positive absolutely on the balance sheet because moving from a liability of 16 million to almost a balanced position is really, really good. And that's testament as well to how well the pension fund is managed in terms of those investments. So that's really, really positive. Just touching on the reserve position, we agreed the budget on Monday night um, and members will recall from the medium term financial forecasts and the work we've done around savings, efficiencies, additional income, that actually the reserve position not only should be balanced now, but we're looking to put money back into reserves over the coming years. So by the time we get to the end of 2028, um, we should have a reserve balance back in the region of about 8 million. And that will be more than 50 percent of our net uh, revenue spend. So, again, a really positive place, a really strong place for the authority to move forward from. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ellis, and thank you, Councillor Barnes, for asking that question, which, of course, gives Mr. Ellis the opportunity to explain that. And I, and I suppose part of Councillor Barnes's question was, when we write these reports, we should think about the audience and perhaps include a little bit for uh, people like me who would need the dummies book on uh, local authority accounting to um, get my, my way through it. So... Uh, there's a thing to the future about possibly having, I don't know, a, a very short commentary because we don't want some of the finance reports go for pages and pages and pages. Um, but if there was a, a simple commentary, a simple summary for, uh, uh, simple is wrong, uh, a commentary that can be easily understood by lay people, and I include councillors in that uh, term of lay people. Uh, but thank you, Councillor Barnes, and thank you, Duncan. Are there any more questions? Of um, just to, um, yes, Councillor Yes, I totally agree with what you're saying there, because when it talks about 81.958 million, that is slightly misleading, isn't it? Because obviously 16 million, that is the pension fund. So anybody looking at that from outside would assume that uh, that's what we got in our coffers to spend with, but we haven't, have we? So like you've just said, it'd be good to have uh, perhaps a bit more... Layman's terms, put it that way. Yeah, obviously, Mr. Ellis is nodding because it won't be his job in the future. Councillor Thomas. To be fair to, uh, to, to him, he does say under the heading of the pension fund liability, um, where are we? The liability is not something that we have control over or that can affect the revenue budget. Its value is reflected in the unusable reserve section of the balance sheet. So he has said, he has spelt it out, it is unusable. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a criticism. I'm just no, trying to put no, like people from outside wasn't looking at it no. to tell you, you know, this is what we've got. It's, it, I think Duncan's done a brilliant job. So, yeah, well done. Thank you. I'm not getting a look of any more questions in the room. So this is uh, for us to um, approve the revised statement of accounts for 2022-23. 2022-2023. And to delegate authority for the 151 officer, section 151 officer in consultation with myself to make minor um, adjustments, non-consequential changes, which will allow us to sign them off, basically, uh, before the end of March. So can I have a move for that by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Biggs. Uh, all those in favour, please? That's uh, all five. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. <laughs> Just the five. Uh, that's carried, thank you. Uh, so, agenda item nine, um, it's an amendment to the Constitution, it's the function of the Licensing and General 
Purposes Committee. Uh, this is for us to consider a change to the Constitution that's been brought about by a change in government policy uh, and to recommend acceptance by the Council. Uh, Lorna Ford. I don't think I've got much to add to that, Chair, to be quite honest. I, th I think it's quite straightforward. In November, we received um, some best practice guidance for licensing authorities, uh, which I've just accidentally clicked on and lost the report. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and I think it is just that. It is just making that constitutional change, um, and this will become an executive function rather than a... Um, a responsibility of the audit and standards committee. Uh, sorry, the, the, the licensing committee. Um, so that's that's what's recommended uh, to full council. Thank you. Can I have a mover for this, please. Oh, sorry. Any questions? I'm sorry. The question because I was quite puzzled by it. I don't understand the distinction between an executive one and a council one because the executive works on behalf of the council, so it's still the council if the if the cabinet decides. I just don't understand it. That's all. Does it make? Is it, it is for us to awe and wonder at the machinations yes, okay. of the government. Not for us to reason we why. We just have just to, to yes. make the change. <laughs> that is the distinction that one is a regulatory matter and one is a, an executive matter. Um, but uh, we, we, do, we do have Su Suzanne online if, if she wishes to add to that. It might be a bit unfair given her first meeting, Very but uh, it probably is a bit. So don't worry, Suzanne. <laughs> Very unfair, Suzanne. Don't bother. We'll, we'll cope with it. Thank so, you, <laughs> so it was moved and was it seconded by you, Councillor Thomas? Thank you. Uh, so all those in favour, please. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. And now agenda item 10 which is another amendment to the Constitution on the procurement environment thresholds. Um, this is also for us to consider and recommend, if necessary, to the, if considered right, to full council. Uh, this is another matter for Duncan Ellis, our interim deputy chief exec. And uh, thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so this report covers two issues. They are both related. They're really proposals to try and improve efficiency, streamline decision making um, and bring some of the thresholds that we have in place up to up to more reasonable uh, levels. I think when I started with you um, a while ago now, one of the first things Lorna asked me to do was look at our, our regulations, some of our policies and things like that. And, and come to a view as to how reasonable they were, whether they needed tightening up, whether they needed changing, whether there were things missing. And I had um, meetings and uh, discussions with around 30 officers in the first couple of weeks when I was with the authority. And one of the things that was raised constantly was um, the procurement threshold. So some of you may be aware that I've, I've got a, a background in procurement as well as finance. And when I looked at those thresholds, they did strike me as very low. What, what you need as an authority in terms of those procurement thresholds is a balance between transparency and openness and following all of those um, UK used to be EU procurement thresholds and rules. But it needs a balance between the amount of work that has to be done not only by officers, but also by suppliers, because if you're going through a full tender process, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of work to undertake to actually get a good submission back to the council. Now, if we're insisting on that at, at low levels, what it has a tendency to do is act as a real barrier to small and medium sized enterprises. It really puts them off. And when you speak to suppliers, um, there are lots of things local government could do to help encourage more bids from smaller from smaller organisations and reducing the amount of red tape for them is one of those areas. So it's not just a benefit for officers. If you don't have to go through a full tender process, we don't have to spend time as officers doing all the paperwork. The suppliers don't have to spend lots of time. And as well, if you think about the suppliers, you might get 10 suppliers that bid. You're only going to get one successful bidder. So the other nine have effectively spent all that time and that resource putting in a submission that is ultimately unsuccessful. So in my view, these are very reasonable increases because I think we were coming from a very, very low base. Um, I've, I've consulted very widely across the organisation. I've spoken to the procurement hub. 
they're comfortable with all of it, what they're looking to do. So some so I hope some of you will be aware that we've moved from EU procurement rules now to a UK uh, regularised approach in terms of procurement. There are new rules coming forward. What the procurement hub is going to do probably later in the summer is to bring forward new policies that align with the UK regulations. Um, and as part of that, they were talking about bringing everyone's uh, procurement thresholds up to the levels we're talking about. So across the hub with Wealdon and Hastings, we'll all be at the same level. So I think that's a reasonable position to be. I think it's a reasonable balance in terms of risk and the work we have to go through. And the other thing is as well, there are lots of frameworks that are available for the organisation. So that means we don't have to do a separate tender ourselves. We can access a framework which does help uh, cut out some of the some of the time it takes, because that's the other issue when you're going through a full tender. It can often take three, four, five months. They're not quick processes. And um, again, we have to comply with um, with UK law. So these are only internal thresholds we're talking about. Once we get to the UK thresholds, you have to follow certain rules. You have to do full tenders. And that's about £170,000, give or take, for supplies and services, and around £4.5 million for works and construction. So again, these thresholds are well, are well below those. And the other issue that I'm raising within the report, again, around thresholds and authorisation levels, is for cabinet and for your 151 officer. So the limit of, of delegated authority and the level of decision making currently for the 151 officer is £50,000, which again, uh, in an organisation with a gross budget nearing 50 million, that's a very, very low threshold. And effectively, what it means is you're going to get lots of reports, lots of decision making uh, coming through committee, which is at quite a low level. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. And I think it's important that we focus on the key issues, the big issues, um, without having to do all of that for, for some of the lower level stuff. So again, there is a recommendation there to, to agree that environment level um, to double it, but it's only going from 50 to 100,000. So they're the proposals, Chair, and there's nothing else really I can add at the moment, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Biggs. Duncan, I don't know if you can help me on this one. Um, if the council is holding S106 money and a parish has come to you uh, with quotes, do these quotes apply to them? No, Section 106 um, receipts or obligations uh, are outside of the procurement, uh, procurement threshold, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's different, totally different things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thomas. Say that this process will save officer time, it will speed up processes and reduce bureaucracy, what's not to like. Well, I sincerely hope it's after we've got the SLA agreement in place with the procurement hub to make Mr. Angel happy. Uh, before you go, Duncan, perhaps you'd like to sort that out. Um, <laughs> so, can I have a, a mover, please, for this recommendation? It's a three part resolution. To approve, uh, to recommend to Council that we approve the procurement thresholds as outlined in powers six and seven, to delegate authority to the Deputy Chief Exec, uh, Section 151 Officer, in consultation with the portfolio holder for finance and governance, to ensure that any future changes reflect the recommendations in that first section, and also uh, it can be progressed, and three, that the environment thresholds as outlined within paragraph 15 be approved. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, Councillor Thomas this time and seconded by Councillor Gray. Uh, all those in favour, please. That is unanimous again. Thank you for that, Mr Ellis. Um, now we're moving on to agenda item 12, which is the work programme. Um, the work programme is the work programme. I don't think we're going to be... Um, suggesting many changes to it at this time. We will have, of course, um, going forward, um, possibly changes in the structure, which would possibly mean uh, a different workload. But that's also part of the consideration. If we were to move to more frequent meetings, the, they'd have to be in sync with the audits and, and the finance. It would be a waste time having a meeting with nothing to talk about. Um, so, uh, any comments on the work programme, please, from 
Any members? Standards reports, none scheduled, none scheduled, none scheduled. So over the course of a year, we're only looking at two, aren't we? Anyway, hmm. so we might as well, well, we've got to wait, but I would assume all members would go with splitting the committees up into two. Yeah, we'll, I said, we'll, we'll take that under uh, consideration about possibly uh, separating the two parts of this, uh, the committee's responsibilities. Councillor Gray. Why is it you, oh, usually a Monday, but occasionally a Wednesday? Is there any I've reason? never understood that myself, because although this one's an extra one, and we were trying to fit this in before March and, and for the uh, audit purposes, there is one a year that's on a Wednesday, isn't there? And, I, and I, perhaps Lisa can explain to us why there's one on a Wednesday. Um, I think historically it was just it was the latest possible day in a month do with the accounting processes, but Duncan may be able to answer that better. But this one, as you say, it was an additional meeting and it was only a, a free date that we could fit in. Uh, and again, that will be um, part of the scheduling, scheduling if we do change the structures. Um, so the last thing to mention is the next meeting is Monday the 25th of March. That closes tonight's meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good night.